I'm Dr. David Wang with RPI and we will be reviewing the physical exam of the foot and ankle. And as you can see that, okay, and up one more time, that the heels kind of go a little bit medially in the, and the ankle kind of shifts a little bit laterally, if you will. So you can see right at the end there that you get that sort of like rolling of the, um, of the foot and that's considered normal. Um, and then other than other, th uh, other things inspection wise in terms of proper muscle bulk, looking for any um, fusiform swelling uh, along the Achilles, which could be an indicator for like an Achilles tendonitis, for example. That's something that on inspection is pretty easy to see. Uh, swelling along the retrocalcaneal bursal areas. So in the supine position, uh, with inspection, uh, there's a little bit of overlap with what we can see in the standing position. We can have like a dependent nature of the bruising where a lot of times if the injury is more proximal over time because of gravity, all that's going to get, you know, sort of like pulled downwards. So a lot of times they may actually have some uh, bruising like in their toes and things like that as the bruise is um, uh, evolving over the course of several days. But the thing about the foot and ankle that's a little bit different perhaps than some of the other major joint areas is that the patients are usually a little bit more specific about where their pain is. For example, if somebody comes with medial knee pain, they'll, they'll be able to kind of pinpoint the area, but usually there's at least three or four structures that are in that immediate region. Whereas in the foot and ankle, a lot of times they can pinpoint with such accuracy that you can narrow it down to just like you know one or two strokes. Um, so for example, if somebody comes in with an inversion sprain, usually they'll put a finger like kind of right over that ATF and they say, yeah, like that's the pinpoint part of my pain. And sometimes they'll even palpate on themselves like, yeah, that spot is like the worst spot. So given that, with the palpatory exam, you don't necessarily have to palpate, you know, like 20 different spots in multiple different compartments of the uh, foot and ankle. It's usually just a couple of spots that come where their primary problem is. Having said that, you can, you can divide the ankle, like many other joint areas, into your quadrants, you know, anterior, medial, lateral, and posterior. And that's a very reasonable way of logically uh, kind of remembering, okay, what are the structures in each quadrant? So starting anteriorly, you know, the interesting thing about anterior, you basically have a lot of your extensor tendons that come through here. And it, it's, if there's gonna be one area where it's a little bit more difficult to be pinpoint, it's actually in the anterior compartment. Uh, take for example, uh, I've had patients that did pinpoint anterior pain kind of right in this region. And so I was thinking, okay, could they have some type of tibiotalar arthropathy or an effusion or something like that? And among the tendons, you have your tibialis anterior, you have your extensor uh, digitorum longus, and you've got your extensor hallucis longus, and they all sit like kind of one next to the other. In fact, I believe um, there are as many bones in the two hands and the two feet as there are in the rest of the body combined. So they'll be able to put a finger on the point, you'll be able to confirm where that tender point is, then you've got to figure out which joint it is. Uh, and so it just, it, you just have to correlate it with the anatomy, um, and it's not real easy uh, on palpatory exam because some of these joints are close together, the orientation is a little bit hard to determine, the joint lines can be a little bit difficult to palpate because of the thickness of those extensor uh, tendons. And then once you bring on board the ultrasound, then you'll be able to trace the bones and figure out which joint it is. Uh, so plain films of the feet can be quite useful in those uh, scenarios when you're trying to identify um, joint um, uh, joint pathology. I mean, this is pretty straightforward, uh, you know, whether it is the um, metatarsal joint, the IP or interphalangeal joint in the um, first ray or the toe, because you only have the two uh, phalanges. So you've got the metatarsal, then the uh, PIP or proximal interphalangeal, then the distal or DIP, distal interphalangeal joint, right? Uh, and then for each one of the toes, and then so doing almost like a little squeeze test to see you know, which one of those joints is um, tender, usually due to an arthritic process or if there's um, like a symptomatic claw toe or, or something along those lines. But then with the ankle, you've got kind of interesting movements, right, because of the nature of how the foot can move. And there is pronation and supination in the foot as well, but inversion and eversion are kind of like combination movements. In other words, inversion is, um, let me think this one through for a moment, um, if they have a posterior impingement in the joint, yeah, and you see this in dancers, uh, among others, um, then they'll get like a, a, a posterior pain with passive um, uh, uh, plantar flexion. So then if you do passive um, uh, yeah, inversion, that will 
reproduce or irritate pain along that ATFL region and or CFL if they have a grade two uh, sprain or worse. Among the toes, the most important one from a range of motion standpoint is in the first metatarsal. Uh, if you have suspicion of a metatarsalgia or a joint capsular problem or even uh, plantar plate injury in the other toes as well, looking at your dorsal and plantar flexion ranges of motion. So this is gonna be an area that's gonna be very, very common uh, for your um, uh, for your exam, but you've got the lateral malleolus here. You have a whole host of different ligaments in this area, including the bifurcate ligament that's a little bit distal to that sinus tarsi, and, and so you just have to be able to pinpoint those areas and try to figure out, okay, which joint is it exactly. So a lot of times you can just kind of pin the tendon against the lateral malleolus to check for tenderness here, looking for some local swelling and things of that nature. A lot of times you'll have a retinacular dysfunction or like even a tear in the retinaculum, which then causes some instability and even subluxation of those fibularis tendons. So it's very difficult to get healing of that fracture, which is why many times it just surgically has to be pinned in order for proper healing to take place. And then posteriorly, so uh, now very, if I can have you roll onto your stomach just briefly for a moment, please, face down. So posteriorly, there isn't that much more to add, maybe some stuff on the plantar surface of the foot, but we talked about the Achilles tendon um, and, um, and the, um, the fusiform swelling that you get. Um, and then from a plantar fascia standpoint, you've got those two bands, medial and lateral. The medial is usually more symptomatic than the lateral, but you can certainly have problems in both. And then so usually the area of tenderness is um, just anterior to like sort of like the, the medius part, if you will, uh, of the calcaneal skin here. So about right in here, and just with, um, with you know, manual pressure, you can get some pretty sharp uh, focal pain in the plantar fascia. Checking the, um, you know, the arches themselves, you can actually get um, some dysfunction of the intrinsic muscles of uh, the foot in terms of the short plantar uh, uh, flexors and so on. Uh, spring ligament tenderness along here. Uh, you can have um, sesamoid, uh, sesamoiditis or sesamoid facet syndromes where direct pressure on the medial or lateral sesamoids can reproduce significant pain. Um, and uh, something in terms of plantar plate injuries, a lot of times you have to go a little bit distal on uh, to the metatarsal head and push sort of posterior, I'm kind of pulling sort of proximally here with my pressure like this to exude pressure on that portion of where that plantar plate attaches in order to reproduce pain. All right, so just going to special test real quick. While we're posterior, uh, Thompson's test here, um, which is, uh, I guess, classically designed to detect a, a full thickness tear of the Achilles tendon, where you squeeze and you actually, um, Garrett, let me have you slide uh, towards me, like downward. Uh -huh. so now, if he had a full thickness tear of that, of that Achilles, that tension line could not be transmitted. So other special tests, uh, these are mostly ligamentous, uh, sort of like uh, 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 stress tests. Then you've got your Taylor tilt test, which hopefully the camera can pick up the angle on this one. Basically, you're doing uh, on that, that inversion motion, but you're, you're trying to really focus it where that CFL is, that calcaneofibular ligament here. Instead of doing it from here, really cupping that calcaneus so I can really get that force uh, focus there to test the integrity of that CFL. However, in those high ankle sprains, sometimes it'll cause some um, referral of symptoms all the way up into that fibula head area because you have that teeter-totter mechanism in terms of the distal and proximal fibula. And this is a uh, kind of a stress test for the tarsometatarsal joint. And you can feel like a laxity a lot of times um, in that area when you are doing that motion testing. Uh, you can do individual metatarsal shearing tests like this, where I can, I can isolate with my fingers, isolate motion between two metatarsals, so here between one and two, here between two and three, and in that way you can detect if there are potential sprains in between the, um, at the intermetatarsal ligaments because you get instability there. Then you've got the, uh, the squeeze test, which is classic for your Morton's neuroma or neuromata is the plural. It's interesting how most people, I think they say neuromas, which I guess is probably acceptable that technically it's like stigmata, neuromata. Anyway, I'm kind of a grammar geek, so. Anyhow, so uh, with that metatarsal squeeze test, basically you, you want to position the foot so that you're stabilizing so you don't get like a curving of the foot, but truly a, a, a medial and lateral compression. So you can do this in the toes, you can do it in the fingers, in the hip, uh, 
Um, the patella grind test is a variation of that. And um, you want to be a little bit careful with this one if they're very symptomatic because it can be pretty painful um, in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the proximal port, the proximal bones so that you can, you know, circumduct at the joint.